in this video we're going to be discussing light and energy and, and just taking a dive into what light is and, and what and how light interacts with with matter so uh, before we get started i am going to play a simple video now these are just ordinary rocks that you that you could potentially find in different parts of the world so let's I'm going to show this to you now. This is under normal light, by the way. Now, I'm going to show you a video that shows these light, rocks under UV light. Totally different feel, isn't it? Light is important to our everyday lives, sunlight specifically. And sunlight harnesses different types of light, that being visible light, UV light, and IR light. But a lot of our energy comes from those shorter wavelengths in the ultraviolet spectrum and in the visible range. And so, uh, when we look at these rocks, these rocks under normal light did not show any color. They were just a dull matte gray color. But under a black light, which has ultraviolet light, they show different colors. And this is all uh, explained by how light itself interacts with matter. And that's what today's topic is going to be about. So. Before we get started, let's talk about properties of light and what it, what it contains. So light exists in two different forms, the electric and magnetic portion. So what does that mean? Well, light propagates as waves through space. And when we look at the two, two different parts, we have the electric portion. The electric portion goes up and down like a sine wave. And if you notice, the magnetic portion oscillates in the same manner. As one goes up, the other one goes out. If one goes down, the other one goes the other direction. And this pattern repeats itself continuously throughout the course uh, of time. And so when we start you know diving into the physics of light and that's not what really really going to get into in here uh, we have what is called in phase and out of phase this is how this is explained by the propagating waves of of light in phase is where you have what you see shown on this slide out of phase is when the electric and magnetic portions are out of sync from each other and so you see darkness so in phase you see light and out of phase you see darkness so electromagnetic waves were first predicted by james maxwell and later confirmed by heinrich hertz maxwell proposed that a time varying electric field generates a magnetic field and vice versa just a little bit of history there for you and now light has two different parts to it that is the wavelength and frequency so these are two characteristics of features of light so wavelength is represented by this symbol here which is called lambda and is the distance between two adjacent peaks. So if we look at two different wavelengths here, or two different waves, we can see, let's see. that the top wave, this is your wavelength, is much longer and the wavelength that you find in the second wave. Now frequency is the number of waves per second or the number of oscillations per second 
this symbol here is called new spelled in you and and that's just it's not v it's not velocity like you'd see in physics class this is the symbol new the greek symbol new and so when you go back and you look at at the wave a versus wave b and you say which one has the higher frequency well wave b does because it has uh, a shorter wavelength and you can see that it has one two three four five six seven eight waves and we're going to call this one second for each of those so you have eight waves per second whereas the the first one has three waves per second so so b has a higher frequency and a shorter wavelength so frequency and wavelength can be mathematically related to each other by using the speed of light equation and so speed of light equation is you can see it already typed into the powerpoint here so c is equal to lambda times nu where c is representing the speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second wavelength oftentimes is represented in nanometers but to use this equation we have to convert uh, nanometers into meters or depending on the problem meters into nanometers but most cases you're going to be converting your nanometers into meters and so we need this conversion factor here one meter is equal to one times ten to the ninth nanometers now frequency uh, is talking about the number of oscillations per second and so this is the typical unit that you use for frequency so the speed of light equation is important because we can solve for either wavelength or frequency all right if we solve for uh, the wavelength we would have c divided by frequency and what we get from this is that since c is a constant we can write it as 1 over nu is equal to lambda and you can see that there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency as the wavelength gets larger the frequency is going to become shorter or lesser and so when we go back up here and we look at wave b it has a high frequency but a short wavelength if we look at wave a it has a long wavelength and low frequency and that's because of this relationship that we see between wavelength and frequency so this is just a couple repetitions so there's an indirect relationship between one wavelength and frequency the higher the frequency the shorter the wavelength the lower the frequency the longer the wavelength now light is broken up into different parts and so you can see this picture here on on your screen and so if we start off on the left side we can see radio waves then it goes to microwaves infrared visible now visible is important because that's what our eyes are are tuned to we can see the visible spectrum we cannot see any other spectrum we'd have to use a special type of of, of filter or whatever to to be able to observe those different types of light now when we talk about the the wavelength and how big these different types of light are wavelength for visible as you can see down here uh, just goes straight down it ranges between uh, right around 350 up to 700 so I like to say between 400 and 800 nanometers is a rough approximation for your visible spectrum and so this is an important uh, thing to remember UV light has a higher frequency so it's going to have a shorter wavelength and UV light usually happens between 0 and 
400 nanometers approximately so if you're in between that range you know that you're going to be dealing with uv light now the the type of light that you saw display on the rocks first uh, in the first video was visible light and then in the second video we saw the rocks fluorescing under uv light now if you go further if you ever broke the bone you probably have had an x-ray done what is the one thing that they do to protect you from those x-rays they cover you with a lead vest and the lead vest helps to block the x-rays from getting into your your soft tissue and causing problems down the road and then we go into gamma rays we hardly ever experienced gamma rays on earth unless you're the hulk of course he definitely has experienced it gamma rays come from pulsating stars from space luckily we have the atmosphere and the magnetic uh, field on earth and so that's able to shield us from the majority of those cosmic rays and gamma rays that are emitted even by our own star the sun emits gamma rays so we do not want to be exposed to those if we can help it now infrared you know that we we use infrared goggles at nighttime to be able to see at night and microwaves it's probably familiar with that because you cook with a microwave and then radio waves is stuff that we listen to now if you look down here at the bottom radio waves just to give you an idea how long the wavelength is the wavelength actually would span that of the empire state building so if we were to lay the empire state building down and flat on the ground the wavelength would go from the bottom all the way to the top so fairly long wavelength and it's a low low frequency you know that there's different types of wavelengths uh, for radio waves and that's am and fm if we get down to infrared you can start to see the size of the wavelength becomes much shorter and as we continue to the right on this slide you can see that definitely the the size of those wavelengths becomes shorter and shorter the shorter those wavelengths become the higher frequency that you're going to experience so here's an example that you can work on all right uh, a meteorite was observed passing through the earth's atmosphere and emitted light with a wavelength of 530 nanometers what is the frequency for this wavelength so here we're going to use the speed of light equation and what we're given is 530 nanometers so before we do anything we need to convert this into meters and doing so uh, we're going to divide by one one times ten to the ninth nanometers per meter and that's going to give me 5.30 times 10 to the minus 7 meters so we have our our wavelength in meters so now we know that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second is equal to 5.3 times 10 to the negative 7 meters times the wavelength or the, the frequency not wavelength sorry so we're going to divide out this 5.3 times 10 to the minus 7 meters so that's going to go away and the meters are going to cancel out also so when we do this division here we get a frequency equal to 5.7 times 10 to the 14th reciprocal seconds and we should expect a high frequency because it has a fairly short wavelength of 530 nanometers okay so in the previous slide we just saw where we calculated the frequency given the wavelength of light now in this we're going to be talking about light and energy and so
the first point here is that Planck studied emission of light by hot objects known as black body radiators. He proposed that hot objects does not emit electromagnetic radiation continuously. So to really make you, you understand what a black body radiator is, think about the stove top, the little iron ring that's on top. When it's not turned on, it's black, but if you turn it on high, it turns to a, a nice bright orange color. And that's because that is a black body radiator. It's emitting light we call it in the form of energy. And so, so this is what Planck studied. Now, Planck suggested that the object emits energy in small specific amounts called quantum. Planck was awarded the prize, the Nobel Prize in 1918 for his work with changing the way scientists view light and energy. And quantum is the minimum amount of energy that can be lost or gained by an atom. And this is Planck's equation, which he defined. H is Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the 34 joules times seconds. We saw nu earlier, which is the frequency, and frequency has units of reciprocal seconds. And then energy is the energy of a quantum of radiation. And the units for energy are in joules. So we asked a simple question. Does blue light have higher energy than green light? Well, to answer that question, we have to understand a little bit about the, the wavelengths of blue light and green light. And they do differ in wavelengths. So the obvious answer is yes, they are going to have different energies because their wavelengths are different. And ultimately their frequencies are going to be different now let me ask a different question let's say we have a flashlight we have two flashlights they're the same flashlight when you turn on it's really bright and then you turn the other one on and it's dim do they have different wavelengths now keep in mind that they are the same flashlight, just two, they're the same make. So it's not necessarily that we're going to be changing the wavelength. We just change the intensity of the light. Just because a, a light is brighter than the other light does not necessarily mean that they have different wavelengths. Uh, it, it, they still have the same amount of energy, regardless of how bright they, they possibly are. And so... Albert Einstein studied and he expanded on Planck's theory. He introduced this idea that is known as the photoelectric effect. And he came up with what is called wave particle duality because he said that waves act like particles in space. And so Einstein suggests the photoelectric effect results can only be explained if light behaves like a particle. So there are two pictures that you see at the bottom right hand and left hand side. So if we pay attention to the left hand side, light travels down in this in propagating waves. It hits the surface of metal. Now, not all light does this because uh, one thing we want to understand is that the metal itself, if you look over on the right hand side where I've circled in yellow, the metal has electrons on its surface and so with the full electric effect what we what Planck has done is he took a light source and this light source emits radiation he used a prism the light shone into the prism and when it came out it separated into the different colors Roy G. B. and so when it hits the metal surface depending on the wavelength will determine of whether the electron is ejected off the surface of the metal and the electron on the surface of the metal has what is called binding energy and binding energy is the minimum amount of energy needed to 
eject an electron from the surface of the metal. Every metal has a specific amount of energy that's required to eject the electron. The question is, what is that energy? So each particle of light carries a quantum of energy and these particles are known as photons. So Einstein expanded on Planck's equation. It didn't really change it too much, but he defined what a photon is. And so he defined the energy of a photon specifically. Now remember Planck's constant is H and then this is your frequency. So the energy of the photon is dependent on how much uh, energy is bound up within the frequency of that wavelength. So looking at a few examples here. So we have sodium vapor lamps are widely used for public areas and they emit 589 nanometers of yellow light so so they're giving you the the wavelength of the light so how much energy is emitted by one excited sodium atom when it generates a photon so we our goal here is to solve for the energy of a photon of light now we're given wavelength which is 589 nanometers so I'm going to go ahead and convert this into meters because we are going to be using the speed of light equation. So there's two equations we're going to use and the first one is the speed of light and the second one is the energy of a photon is equal to h nu. So these are the two equations that you have to use. So in the speed of light equation we're going to solve for frequency and we're going to take the speed of light and we're going to divide it by the wavelength that you see there that, that we calculated in meters and then in, in part two we're going to take the the frequency and Planck's constant and we're going to multiply them together to calculate the energy of that photon of light so so the, to, the speed of light is three times ten to the eighth we're going to divide that by five point eight nine times ten to the minus seven and we get a frequency equal to 5.1 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds. So again, I took the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th, and I divided it by 5.89 times 10 to the minus 7. So now we're going to take the frequency and we're going to plug it into the energy of a photon equation. And I'm going to call this Planck's equation just for shorthand. So Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. We're going to multiply that by 5.1 times 10 to the 14th reciprocal seconds. You'll notice that the seconds cancel out here and we end up with a value of 3.37 times 10 to the negative 19 joules for the energy of that photon of light. So, so that answers question three. Now, Question four, the bonding energy, also known as the work function for a metal, is the minimum amount of energy needed to eject an electron by irradiating the surface of the metal with light. Magnesium has a bonding energy of 5.9 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So part A says, what is the minimum frequency of light required to eject electrons from magnesium? So the one thing that they do give you is they give you the bonding energy of the light so we're going to use the energy uh, Planck's constant here so we're going to use Planck's equation and we know the energy we're going to solve for the frequency so we're going to divide out Planck's constant from the energy so 5.90 times 10 to the minus 19 joules divided by 5.1 
6.626 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. So notice the joules cancel out here. And I get 8.90. So 8.90 times 10 to the 14th reciprocal seconds. So that's so that's part A. Now part B says what is the minimum wavelength of light required to eject electrons from magnesium? So we're going to take the frequency here and we're going to solve for the wavelength. Uh, utilizing the speed of light equation so we're going to divide the speed of light by the frequency so 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by 8.9 times 10 to the 14th reciprocal seconds seconds are canceled out here so I end up with 3.9 three seven times ten to the minus seven meters so I'm going to convert that into nanometers which is three hundred and thirty seven nanometers now what I learned from this is that this light is just a little lesser than 400 which we talked earlier about 400 being in the visible range so this actually falls within the UV range so we would expect UV light to with at least a minimum wavelength of 337 nanometers to eject the electron from the surface of this metal. So the last thing here is can light come from the electron? Uh, I am going to make this a separate video so I'm going to stop here for now. If you have any questions just just let me know. Thanks.